Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone to the inaugural session of the Emirates Cardiac Society Multimodality Rounds. This is the formal activity of the Emirates Cardiac Society Imaging Working Group. My name is Faraz al Badarin. I'm a multimodality imager and a cardiovascular outcomes researcher at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. And I'm also the head of the imaging working group of Emirates Cardiac Society. I'm very excited to launch this educational series that we have diligently worked on to deliver you the high quality content that you all aim for. And we ho really hope that this educational activity will be up to your expectations. Briefly about the uh, Emirates Cardiac Society multimodality rounds. This is going to be a, um, an educational activity um, um, webinar based that's going to happen roughly every other month and will uh, fo focus and highlight the critical role of various multimodality cardiac imaging um, uh, in diagnosing and managing uh, patients with various disease processes. So every uh, webinar, every session, we're going to focus on a disease process and discuss how various modalities uh, contribute and help uh, in this regard. In this vein, let me first uh, thank uh, my uh, co-moderators and co-presenters on this session that really represent the core group of cardiac imaging affectionados in the United Arab Emirates, uh, who have worked diligently to put together uh, a, a session that we really hope uh, meets your expectations. I also would like to thank uh, the sponsors for this uh, session and for all uh, kinds of educational activities sponsored by Emirates Cardiac Society, uh, without which such activities uh, cannot be uh, possible. Without further ado, it gives me uh, utmost pleasure and honor to introduce uh, my co-moderator for tonight's activity, uh, uh, Dr. Jouairi uh, Al Ali, who is the uh, president of the Emirates Cardiac Society and a cardiologist at uh, uh, Rashid Hospital, who is going to be uh, uh, discussing the role of echocardiography in evaluating patients uh, with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, beyond ejection fraction. And this is the focus of today's uh, session. Dr. Joeria. Thank you, Dr. Faraz, for the kind introduction. Um, of course, for, for people who don't know me, I'm an uh, echocardiographer at heart, uh, and that makes uh, this activity very important and close to my heart. Uh, and we really are looking for uh, your feedback and uh, your um, contribution into this activity. Uh, we really want to bring the imaging, uh, the cardiac imaging group in the United Arab Emirates together. We want to learn from each other and uh, uh, improve the level of our awareness uh, of how these different imaging modalities uh, help, help us manage our patients. So um, I'll start off with my presentation. So we'll, I'll be talking about uh, the role of echo and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that doesn't mean I'm gonna talk about their cell dysfunction. So let's hear what I'm gonna say. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, I'm sure you know uh, that it's a clinical syndrome. Uh, and it's becoming increasingly uh, prevalent with the growing population and the aging population. Uh, over half of patients with unexplained dyspnea who are reverse, referred for invasive evaluation end up having heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And about 70% of patients about, with heart failure above the age of 65 have a normal ejection fraction. So it's a very common clinical syndrome but it's the most difficult to diagnose because there isn't one specific uh, way to diagnose it. With reduced ejection fraction, you have the clinical syndromes plus the low ejection fraction. And most of the time that's more than enough. And then you have biomarkers as well, but here it becomes more complex. And usually you're dealing with elderly patients and with patients with comorbidities, which make the clinical diagnosis much, much more difficult because there can be many different contributors to the diagnosis. So what's the role of ECHO? It can help you diagnose whether the patient Disney is actually related to heart failure or to another cardiac uh, issue, or it can actually make you uh, reach the diagnosis that this is non-cardiac 
neither preserved ejection fraction nor other cardiac problems. It helps you with the management and uh, with evaluating the hemodynamic status of the patient and the pathophysiological phenotype. And it also helps you with risk stratification of the outcome for a patient. So I told you, we're not gonna talk about diastolic dysfunction because diastolic dysfunction does not mean heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Definitely patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction would have an element of diastolic dysfunction, but uh, not every patient that you read their echo and they have diastolic dysfunction have heart failure. Um, so diastolic dysfunction is defined as the prolongation of relaxation of early diastole, uh, an increase in viscoelasticity of the LV diastolic chambers, or some combination of both. And as you know, decline in LV relaxation is something that happens with age. Uh, so reduce in LV relaxation and compliance is part of normal aging. And not all patients with diastolic dysfunction will end up having heart failure or preserved ejection fraction. So in one prospective cohort, only 12% of patients who had severe diastolic dysfunction and an echo end up developing heart failure after six years of follow-up. So 12% is very low, uh, which makes you wonder like, how sensitive these markers are. And approximately one third of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction involved in clinical trials had evidence of diastolic dysfunction on echo. So here comes the problem. You do, you do not have, uh, these two terms do not uh, really correlate with each other, but it's uh, still important to measure diastolic dysfunction because that can make your diagnosis easier. And not only that, it has a prognostic effect. So it helps you uh, prognosticate the patient, but it's not used in isolation for the diagnosis. So you have to measure it, but then you have to look at the whole picture of the patient, the clinical uh, presentation, and look for other features other than just diastolic dysfunction. So how do we evaluate, evaluate filling pressures? Is the ratio of early diastolic uh, transmitral inflow velocity to the mitral annular tissue velocity? So the E to E prime ratio, it's it is the most studied uh, measure of filling pressure. Of course, there are other measures of filling pressure, but this is the most robust one. Um, uh, but it has been also questioned lately. And in a recent meta-analysis, it, it was found to have modest correlation uh, with invasively obtained uh, resting filling pressures. Uh, but despite this modest correlation, it's still a valuable tool to be used. So this is the classic, classification of diastolic dysfunction that you have learned a long time ago. You uh, usually with a normal filling, you have a, 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 a prominent E uh, wave and a small A wave, and you might have a diastasis wave. Uh, and in the tissue Doppler, you find that the E uh, prime is uh, prominent and the A prime is less prominent. And with abnormal relaxation, you will find that the E wave is, becomes smaller, so the E to A ratio is less than 0.8, um, and the tissue Doppler will be equally affected. Uh, and then when you get grade two, which is pseudo normalization, you get similar E to A to the normal, but the tissue Doppler will be uh, reduced, so the E prime will be reduced. And then with uh, grade three diastolic dysfunction, you will have uh, the E velocity will be higher and the deceleration type will be shorter. And then with grade four, you will have even higher uh, E velocity with a shorter deceleration time. And this will be a, a reversible world that's alpha. Um, and this has, uh, as we said, it's very, um, suggestive, but it's not, it has moderate correlation. So that's why you have to look at different parameters in assessing diastolic dysfunction. So the latest guideline uh, says that you have to um, um, include these four uh, parameters in the assessment of diastolic dysfunction. So the average E to E prime ratio, more than 14, a septal E velocity or a lateral E velocity less than seven and less than 10, a TR velocity more than 2.8, and an LA volume index more than 34 ml per meter square. So if the patient has a normal LV function and you look at these four parameters and more than half of them is positive, you have diastolic dysfunction, less than half of them is positive, you have a normal diastolic function. And if exactly half of them is positive, then you're in an intermediate uh, situation where you have to look at other uh, variables to assess uh, diastolic function. Whereas if you have an abnormal uh, LV, 
then by definition, you, you're starting with diastolic dysfunction. So whatever is the, the parameters, you have some level of diastolic dysfunction. So you look at the E to A prime, um, E to A ratio less than 0.8, and if the E velocity less than 50, then this is grade one with normal LA pressure. Uh, if you have the E to A, uh, E to A ratio is more than two, then this is grade three. And anything in between, you look at the three other parameters as well. And if two uh, or three of them is positive, you have a grade two. If two or three of them are negative, you have a grade one. And anything in between, you would require more assessment to assess diastolic dysfunction. So that made it a little bit easier um, because you, you only have to look at four main parameters at the beginning. And then if that doesn't help, you have to go for uh, something more advanced. So uh, what are uh, common uh, differential diagnoses for heart failure preserved ejection fraction and how would you look at them in echo? So of course, a classic one is a hypertrophic um, uh, cardiomyopathy where you have an asymmetrical hypertrophy and increase in LD wall thickness. You might have LVOT obstruction and SAM. Uh, a restrictive cardiomyopathy, you generally will have small LV cavities, increase LV wall thickness and sparkling appearance of the myocardium. Uh, you might have epical sparing and strain, we'll go over strain later on, and a severely reduced tissue doppler. In pulmonary arterial hypertension, you'll have a in significantly increased uh, RV systolic pressure with no signs of elevated filling pressures. You can have isolated right heart dilatation, uh, pulmonary artery dilatation, and RVOT Doppler systolic uh, notch. And then in constrictive pericarditis, you have uh, pericardial thickening, the septal bounce. Uh, you can have annulus paradoxus and increase of respiratory variation in mitral and tricuspid inflow. For valvular heart disease, of course, you're going to have the morphological abnormalities in the valve according to which disease you have. And for coronary artery disease, you will have wall motion abnormality. For chronic thromboembolic disease, you will have RV systolic, uh, increase in RV systolic pressure with no signs of elevated filling pressures. Uh, and um, in right uh, heart um, um, and high output heart failure, you will have an increased uh, Doppler altogether in all uh, in, uh, LVOT and mitral and all Doppler areas. And uh, if you look at the parameters for the diagnosis of heart failure of preserved ejection fraction, although they, they have very good p-values, they, they vary in sensitivity a lot. So that's the reason why you need to look at the patient in general and you look, and you look at all the parameters together. Um, so you have sensitivities run, ranging between 24, uh, 26 to 78 at best. And you have specificities ranging from around 60 to 88 at best. So uh, this is why it's a very comprehensive assessment when you're looking at a patient with diastolic dysfunction. So this helps. So this is the uh, HEPPF score uh, that looks at the probability of a patient having a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So H is two for heavy and hypertensive. So if the, if the patient has uh, have a big uh, body mass uh, index, then he gets two points. If they're hypertensive, being in two or more antihypertensive, he gets one point. Atrial fibrillation gets three points, and then pulmonary hypertension gets one point. Elderly, uh, more than sixty, gets one point, and elevated filling pressure by echo, which uh, which corresponds to an E to E prime of more than nine gets one point. And the sum of these points give you a different probability of having a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, that could help, but that also could be confusing because if you get a heavy patient with atrial fibrillation who is hypertensive, then you're already uh, at a signal, almost at 80% probability of having heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and that can be tricky clinically if you just rely on the score and not look at the clinical features of the patients. So this is what ECHO can do. It can evaluate the filling pressures either by the E to E prime ratio or uh, by RV systolic pressure measurements, and then can look at other indices of uh, diastolic dysfunction like the, uh, the, like the mitral inflow or the LA volume um, or the pulmonary veins. 
and it can identify disorders that mimics heart failure preserved ejection fraction like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and valvular heart disease. Uh, and then it can give you idea about the pathophysiology and the phenotype, uh, whether you have RV dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, LA dysfunction, uh, signs of obesity, and uh, if you have areas of ischemia, and then it can help you risk stratify by looking at prognostic information with heart failure preserved ejection fraction, uh, like LB hypertrophy, in, uh, um, impaired global lymphadenal strain, high filling pressure, and presence of LA dysfunction. And of course, we cannot talk about this without talking about stress echo. So stress echo can help in the, if you don't find features of diastolic dysfunction at baseline. Um, so this is a spike. If you see at baseline, uh, you have an E to A ratio that is less than 0.8 and a normal tissue Doppler. And then you, you see that with, um, uh, with the exercise, there's an increase in E velocity, but there is no significant increase in the E, uh, e, uh, e prime, which, means to a, which leads to a significant E to E prime ratio, which means uh, you have an increase uh, in felling pressures. So let's talk about this case. So this is a 66 years old uh, with no prior, with prior history of four vessel cabbage in 2008, uh, presented with lower limb edema and shortness of breath for the past six months. He had an echo done in another country reported as normal, and he had an NGO as well with short patent graft. He had history of melina and anemia and derwent the G-scope and was found to have duodenal ulcer and polyps. He has a blood pressure of 117 over 85 and a pulse of 89. He has bilateral basal crepitations, decreased air entry in the right side, his abdomen showed mild hepatomegaly, uh, and he has bilateral low lymphedema. His white count is a little bit high, 14.6, hemoglobin was 9.3, and platelet was 300, and his creatinine was 1.2. His pro BNP was 6,155, which is elevated. And this is his ECG. Uh, what's striking about the ECG, you see the low voltages all over, uh, the pseudo Q waves, or their Q waves, I mean, his known priority disease, maybe their real Q waves, their Q waves anteriorly, and he is in atrial fibrillation as well. So this is his echo. You see that the LV is thickened and it's a little bit bright, and even the, the, um, uh, the valves are a little bit thickened. And if you look at the, um, I think this is supposed to run. It's not running, but he had a normal ejection fraction, but all the, the walls are thickened. Uh, even the uh, papillary muscles are a little bit thickened, and he has a left atrial enlargement, a right atrial enlargement, and he has a precardial effusion as well over here. So this is his death cell function assessment. So you see that he, he doesn't have an A wave because in a, he's in AFib, but this is his E uh, velocity which was uh, 0.88, and he had a uh, reduced, um, uh, increased E to E prime, 21. His TR velocity was 23, and he has an LA dilatation. So this is a strain for people who are used to looking at the strain. So um, uh, usually the red color is close to normal strain, and as the color fades, it's abnormal strain. The normal strain is 20 plus or minus two. So you see that he has a preserved strain at the apex, which is reduced all over, which is um, what we call the cherry on top appearance. So that led to specific diagnosis in him. He underwent the abdominal fat, fat biopsy, which was suggestive of amyloidosis, and he ended with a bone marrow biopsy and he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So what's strain? Strain is a local shortening and thickening and lengthening of the myocardium as a measure of regional uh, LV function. So you, there are ways of uh, measuring strain. Tissue Doppler is considered one way of measuring strain, but it measures it in one local area where you put your, the point for the, uh, for the pulse wave uh, for the tissue Doppler to be measured. Whereas speckle tracking, what we use and when we're measuring strain, measures every single speckle in the myocardium to see how much that speckle moves during systole. So this is how the machine me measures it. It looks at a certain area, points these speckles in it, and then it sees during the cardiac cycle, where does the speckle move to, and then measures that uh, amount of motion. So uh, in systole, it's supposed to be, the, the muscle is supposed to be thickening, so you're supposed to see this movement. And there are many different uh, directions of strain. So longitudinal strain goes longitudinally, so from the apex to the base. Circumferential goes 
circumferentially. And then radial strain is just the thickness that you would see, um, uh, well, radially. Um, so these are the different types of strain. Usually we use GLS, global longitudinal strain, because it's easier to measure. It's measured through epical um, uh, views, whereas circumferential and radial strain, you need to have a short axis views, and sometimes the image quality is not good enough to measure strain in this views. Also, global longitudinal strain is, uh, has better correlation with different um, clinical um, diseases, as we will see. So what is the value of using strain in heart failure? Um, not only that it's abnormal during heart failure, but if you look at stage A heart failure, which is someone who has only risk factors of, coronary artery, of heart disease, but do not have actually clinical heart failure, you would see that global longitudinal strain is already depressed. So this gives you prognostic information that the fact that this patient is at risk of developing heart failure. Not only that, uh, the type of involvement in, of GLS is different from heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So with, while in reduced ejection fraction, all types of strain is reduced and preserved ejection fraction, you will see that mainly longitudinal strain is reduced, whereas circumferential strain is actually increased and radial strain is a little bit reduced. So this is actually a, a, a case um, report of a 28 years old patient who underwent echo for screening for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because he carries the gene for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, and as a part of family screening. He does not have um, symptoms of heart failure and he does not have a thickened ventricle. And despite that, his GLS was reduced. Uh, he had a GLS of 16%. So that shows you that even though he's asymptomatic and with no hypertrophy by echo or CMR, his GLS was uh, reduced, which shows you that he's at risk of developing heart failure. So this is uh, the patterns of strain and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus reduced ejection fraction. So with preserved ejection fraction, uh, you have a re reduction in longitudinal strain and the radial strain, but circumferential strain is uh, preserved or augmented. Uh, and in the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, all types of strain is reduced. And it does have prognostic um, uh, um, uh, information, whether you're, you're talking about uh, reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction. So even with patients with preserved ejection fraction, having a GLS less than 15 to 16 uh, carries more probability of events. So it helps you also and then find the etiology of heart failure with preserved ejection so, uh, fraction. So this is someone who does not have heart failure. It's someone with an athlete heart. So you see that GLS is completely uh, preserved. This is a patient with uh, or different patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, generally in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you will see reduction in strain in the areas where, uh, where there is hypertrophy. So this is someone with concentric uh, hypertrophy. This is a patient with apical hypertrophy, so the reducing, reduction in strain is in the apex. And this is a patient with mainly septal hypertrophy, so the septal and posterior wall is involved, whereas the apex and the lateral wall is preserved. And this is another example of how the strain is reduced in areas with hypertrophy. If you look at this, this is a normal heart, the strain is normal. And if you look at this, this is a patient with apical hypertrophy, so this is the apex. And you see that the GLS is reduced at the apex. Now, this is similar to the case that I showed you. This is amyloid. Uh, so you find the cherry on top appearance. So you see that the strain is preserved at the apex and reduced at the bases. And there is a two to one ratio between the apex and the base. Um, you see that uh, it doesn't have to be exactly a cherry on top. So sometimes you can find that it's uh, according to the extent of the disease, maybe the gradient is less um, significant, but it's still there. You can see it uh, on the images on the left as well. So this is Fabry disease and Fabry disease. You see that uh, there is reduction in strain in the areas that correspond to the papillary muscles. So the uh, lateral and posterior, posterior aspect. And this was talked about initially uh, about the interventional variability of GLS, but uh, this was studied extensively and there is no significant interventional variability in GLS. And if you look at it, um, 
uh, at the end of intervalability for GLS compared to pulse wave or LV and diastolic dimension or um, interventricular septal thickness or all other parameters, you'll find that the least variability is with GLS. Now, in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about myocardial work. So myocardial work is adding one further step on top of GLS. Um, so it's basically you're trying to measure the amount of work or energy used by the left ventricle systolic function in every single beat. It also represents the external work done by the ventricle to eject black and blood into the aorta. And it uh, augments uh, what you get from uh, strain measurement by taking dynamic LV pressure into account. So basically, when you're trying to do measure myocardial work, you do all the steps that you do for measuring strain, except you take into account what the patient's blood pressure is. And I'll show you how that is important. So this adds an important dimension to the assessment of LV function and facilitates interpretation of strain traces in relation to LV pressure dynamics. So the idea of myocardial work is the amount of work that it takes to push 100 kilogram 5 meters should be equal to the amount of work that is taken to push a 50 kilogram 10 meter. So this is the amount of work over here. So whether the distance is shorter or the distance is longer, it depends how much strain that's being um, uh, done uh, to achieve that work. So uh, basically we're plotting uh, LV pressure against strain uh, to get the amount of work that is done by the myocardium. So, and it's a counterclockwise curve like you see over here. It starts from mitral valve opening, mitral valve closure, and there's significant increase in strain here, aortic valve opening, and then ejection of blood, aortic valve closure, and then there is diastole. So, this represents, if you remember from pathophysiology, the pressure volume curve that we measure in, uh, invasively, but this looks, um, uh, uh, takes blood pressure as a surrogate for LV pressure and uses a strain uh, on, the, uh, on the other arm uh, to basically measure how much myocardial work is done. And then it it takes the, into account what is the actual myocardial work that was constructive that led to um, uh, a stroke volume versus the wasted work that was done uh, before aortic valve uh, um, opening and after aortic valve closure. And this is uh, plotted like this, similar to how strain is plotted. And then you can measure basically the amount of uh, constructive work versus the amount of wasted work. And the more wasted work there is, the less uh, the work efficiency is. So this is just to show you how it's done in clinical practice. So this is someone who, who was pre-CRT. Uh, um, so you see that the septum is not working at all or it's not contributing to the work, to the actual work to, for the, um, for the stroke volume. And six months after uh, implanting a CRT, you see that these um, segments in the septum has been recruited and now they're contributing to the myocardial efficiency. So uh, this is important because we rely on global longitudinal strain in many things, including chemo-induced cardiomyopathy. So uh, we're not, I didn't talk a lot about chemo-induced cardiomyopathy here for sake of time, but uh, we know that from all the guidelines that you, you have to measure GLS initially, and then you have to measure it serially. And if there's a drop in GLS, you should consider uh, starting therapy to reduce uh, uh, risk of, cardio, um, of chemo induced cardiomyopathy. So this is a patient, this case was presented in the ESC last year. So this is a patient who started the baseline uh, LV function of 54 and the GLS was minus 19, which is normal. And at that time, the blood pressure was 119 over 71 and the global work index was 1,771. So on follow-up, the ejection fraction was 53, dropped by 1%, which is not that significant, but the GLS dropped by 16%, which is significant, and it got to minus 16. So if you take only this information and you do not look at the myocardial work, you would start this patient on a beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. But 
uh, when the blood pressure is measured, the blood pressure is 155 over 93, which is elevated. And if you take that into consideration and me measure the global work index, it, it turns out to be elevated rather than reduced. So it's 2000. So this patient does not require therapy, just requires treatment for hypertension. And then repeated measurements showed that the GLS actually did not drop. It was because of the increase in blood pressure. So th this is in contrast to someone who actually had chemo-induced cardiomyopathy. So this is someone who started with an ejection fraction of 56 and a GLS of minus 20 and the blood pressure is 122 over 73, and the myocardial work index was 1,800. And then on follow-up, there was a drop of ejection fraction by 11%, a drop in GLS by 35%, but also a drop in the, uh, in the um, um, global work index, which confirms that this is a true drop in GLS, and this was not just related to um, uh, a measurement um, error from strain, and then this patient requires therapy. It's also used in hypertensive heart disease. So this is a case report that showed um, as uh, there is an improvement. And uh, so this is someone who presented with hypertensive heart disease and ejection fraction of 15%, and there was a significant drop in um, GLS. On follow-up, the ejection fraction improved to 40%. There was an improvement in GLS and an improvement in the uh, global work index. Uh, and in further follow-up, there was a continued improvement in ejection fraction, improvement in global work index, and improvement in uh, GLS, which was um, to confirm that there was actual myocardial disease at present that was not just the effect of hypertension, and uh, that continued to improve with therapy. Uh, there has been a lot of publications for myocardial work index for the past two years. This was one of the uh, interesting things that I saw. This basically they took up all normal patients who are running a marathon. So not patients really, normal volunteers who are running a marathon. They measured GLS at the beginning, GLS at, uh, immediately after the marathon, and then GLS uh, three days after the marathon. Um, and they measured their work uh, index as well uh, on all these three occasions. And they found two groups of patients, a group of patients where their uh, global work index did not change at all, whereas another group who had a, um, uh, an increase in their global work index, and then that normalized after three days. And that's hypothesis generating because it tells you that there are two different ways of how myocardium uh, reacts to uh, stress. Um, the, um, I think it's, it's very uh, thought provoking and I think it's something that we need to do more in clinical practice to learn more what were the implications of this will be. So the take home messages, heart failure with preserved ejection is a uh, preserved ejection fraction is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, assessment of filling pressure is important for diagnosis and prognosis. Myocardial strain is a reliable measure of systolic um, dysfunction and um, uh, uh, can give you clues to the diagnosis of certain cardiomyopathies, and myocardial work can add further information in diagnosing patients with heart failure. And with that, I could conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Joyri. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, do you want to move ahead with the Next presentation. Uh, so we're having a little technical difficulty. So we'll go, we're going to go ahead with um, a case presentation from uh, Dr. Asafa al mahnar Dr. Asafa, I think, is very well known uh, in the cardiology community in the UAE. She is an excellent uh, cardiac imager with special passion for cardiac CMR. Uh, and she will give us a talk about uh, a case about hypertensive heart disease. So go ahead, Dr. Asaba. Sorry, I'm just trying to share. Just one second. Okay. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be part of this uh, excellent uh, webinar tonight. Uh, so I'll be presenting uh, today two cases. Uh, the first case uh, will be um, a case of heart failure with resolution fraction and hypertensive heart disease, but well, the main focus will be in the role of ECHO in trying to diagnose uh, this uh, HFPF case, uh, uh, diagnosis. The second case will touch a very briefly upon the echo and then we will look into the other multimodality images that will try to highlight the importance of gathering information in order to reach the diagnosis with HFPF. So the first case is a 67 years old uh, new patient uh, to our service who came to the emergency department with one week history of progressive shortness of breath and chest tightness. She has a background history of hypertension, uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, she had an ischemic heart disease with BCI to the RCA uh, in 2011 and LAD and left circumflex back in 2015. She's a lady with history of obstructive sleep apnea on CPAP. Also, she has history of, of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She denies any close contact with the patient with COVID-19, no fever, cough, sore throat, or any GI symptoms. Her initial clinical examination, uh, the patient looked distressed. She was using accessory muscles for respiration. Her oxygen saturation was reduced at 88% on room air. She's a pretty slim lady with a weight of 60 kg. Her blood pressure was elevated at 200 over 110. She was tachypneic with a, a, a breath rate of 28 breaths per minute. Her heart rate was 90 beats per minute and it was regular to palpation. There was no GVB, however, she had bilateral crepitation up to her mid zones. She had scattered tweeze as well as bilateral bitingodema. She's on extensive medications. Uh, she's on balsartan, amlodipine, beta blocker, uh, moxonidine, isosorboid dinitrate, hydrochlorothiazide, hydralazine as well. She's on atorvastatin for her dyslipidemia, abixaban for her atrial fibrillation, insulin and metformin for her diabetes, and she's on PR uh, in nebulizers. Her initial laboratory investigation re remit a normocytic uh, anemia of uh, hemoglobin of 10. Her creatinine was elevated at 130 millimol per uh, liter. Her white cells were normal, CRB mildly elevated, ProBNB above 2000, and her HbA1c was elevated at 10.3. This is her initial ECG in the emergency. Uh, it showed a normal sinus uh, rhythm. There was no significant uh, ST changes. She was managed in the emergency with four liters of oxygen, intravenous rosemite, some uh, nebulizers, and she had a good diuresis and felt better. Referred to us the next day to further evaluate the reason and uh, uh, of her uh, uh, new presentation to us. So. I will try to present the echo images to you. And while you're looking at the images, I would like you to have to think about, does this lady have diastolic dysfunction? Does this lady have increased filling pressure? So this is her parasternal long axis view. And you can see uh, definitely there is evidence of left uh, ventricular hyperatrophy. There is pretty much good LV function from this view. This is her short axis view. Again, good LV function with LVH. For chamber view, you can see mildly dilated left atrium from this uh, limited view. And then when we do further, uh, uh, her 2D uh, measurement showed a septum of 13 and a posterior wall of 14. Um, her left atrial uh, volume indexed was 30 mL per meter squared. She had reduced RV function with TAPSI, TAPSI over 12. Her E to A ratio was one. Her uh, uh, E to over E prime of the septum was uh, 27, and her lateral E to A prime was 19.2. Her um, tricuspid velocity as 3.5 centimeter per second. So having all this uh, information into sight and what we heard from Dr. Juwairia that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is not only diastolic dysfunction. So 
does this lady have hypertensive heart disease leading to having heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? So to answer this question, we have to go back into her clinical history and presentation. When we look at her clinical picture, she's the patient is a female, she's hypertensive and diabetics, which uh, seems both of them are uncontrolled. She has a history of coronary artery disease, disease renal failure, obstructive um, um, uh, um, apnea and atrial fibrillation. And if we look at all of these uh, parameters together, she have the comorbidities as well as the risk factor of developing heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The second question, does she have a structural changes? Um, the answer is yes. You could see that there was evidence of NVH as well as dilated left atrium. Moving into the Two questions I've asked initially, does she have diastolic dysfunction? Does she have increased filling pressure? That will explain her clinical presentation to the emergency department that evening. So when we look at um, uh, our parameters uh, that we know, we can see that uh, this uh, lady have an average E over E prime that is more than 14. Her septal velocity was definitely less than seven, as well as her lateral E prime velocity less than 10. Her TR velocity was more than 2.8. However, her E volume was increased, but that does not fulfill the above 34 mil per meter square. So she was having three out of four of these parameters, and this will confirm that she does have diastolic dysfunction. The second question is, does she have increased LV filling pressure? She had an E over E prime of one. She had two out of three of the uh, other criteria of having uh, elevated uh, filling pressure. So the answer to this question, yes, she had grade two diastolic dysfunction with increased elevated pressure. So she had all the clinical picture of risk factors and comorbidities of having heart failure with reserve ejection, ejection fraction. She had structural heart abnormalities. She had diastolic dysfunction with increased filling pressure. And this, putting all these things together, we can see that uh, this patient's most likely presentation that he, uh, that is heart failure or reserve ejection fraction a uh, secondary to hypertensive heart disease. Moving into the second uh, case, uh, this is a 56 years old male who came to the emergency department with sudden onset of chest tightness after smoking shisha. On further questioning this patient, he reports that he had few months of exertional shortness of breath. He's a heavy smoker, have hypertension and dyslipidemia. In a clinical initial examination, uh, revealed normal oxygen saturation at room air. He was obese at a uh, weight of 100. His blood pressure was elevated to 100 over 105. His heart rate was 85 beats per minute, which was regular. There was no GVP, but there was bibasal crepitation. He was on four antihypertensive medication, Valsartan, uh, calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, hydrochlorothiazide, as well as uh, atorvastatin for his dyslipidemia. This is his initial ECG. Um, you can see that there is LVH with a T wave inversion um, indicating there is a strain. There was no ST, cha uh, ST changes of any significant. His laboratory investigation revealed hemoglobin 14, creatinine was normal at 87, white cells were normal. His pro BMB was high at 1500, and he had a marginally increased troponin. And because of that, and, and, and because of the sudden onset of chest tightness, we went and we did for him a CT from the emergency room. And we can see that all his coronaries are, 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 are normal, uh, very uh, mild uh, disease, both uh, of, of uh, the LAD, but otherwise normal coronary tree. This is the echocardiogram, and I would like you, while you are looking at the echo, to think of answering these two questions. He has LVH, definitely, but is it concentric? Is it asymmetric? So this is the barostinal lung axis view. Uh, this is his short axis uh, view um, for chamber view. Two chamber view. Yeah. <laughs> 
and we when we did the two D measurement, we found that the, the 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 septum was measured at sixteen millimeter, whereas the posterior wall was fourteen millimeter, and he his E to E uh, over E uh, prime, um, uh, ratio was one point five. His E over E prime was elevated uh, in the septum of twenty three, as well as of the lateral wall to nineteen. Um, uh, uh, level and we also did for this gentleman uh, global longitudinal strain and you can see there is significant reduction of all uh, the segments of uh, his uh, GLS with an overall GLS of uh, of uh, ten percent. So when we think about a thick heart um, and, and, and my, my topic today is hypertensive of heart disease. That be, could be the case. However, we have to have a clear mind and think of other possible diagnoses uh, that might explain his thick LVH, especially of, uh, if the LVH was above 15 or there was some question of being uh, asymmetrical. Um, we had a good uh, talk and a good few slides with Dr. Joyria about uh, the use of GLS in uh, different uh, cardiomyopathies. Um, um, so when we compare our case, we, you can see this is an extreme case or a late case of hypertensive heart disease where all the segments was uh, significantly reduced as compared to patient who would have a stage A heart failure or early hypertension where it is usually normal and what is the early sign of that is affecting the symptom uh, with a mild reduction in the in the in, in, in the uh, GLS. So because of that, we went and we had a CMR, we went and we did CMR for this gentleman. So you can see the four uh, chamber review on your left and the right chamber and the two chamber review on, on your right. Um, there was a pretty much uh, um, a normal ejection fraction was estimated at 50. Um, and we can see that uh, there is a left ventricular hyperatrophy, which uh, is uh, uh, looks uh, concentric uh, uh, pattern. Looking at this series, uh, short axis view from the base down to the apex. Uh, and, and the beauty of cardiac MRI is the ability to plan your um, measurement in any direction that you would like. And you would like to do the measurement where you think visually it is of, a, of the maximum thickness in order to reach the appropriate diagnosis. And in this gentleman, we found that he had concentric left ventricular hypertrophy of 15 millimeter. Uh, some of the, the, the tricky things when you measure the LVH is, is the septo uh, marginal trabeculation that we see it here uh, uh, in the septum and uh, MRI can help you to try to differentiate and exclude that from measuring the um, uh, ventricular uh, septum. Um, this is the late cardiac enhancement of this uh, gentleman. Uh, there is a mid-wall enhancement in the four-chamber uh, uh, view. Uh, there is also some diffuse epicardial uh, uh, enhancement, indicating a non-ischemic pattern of uh, cardiomyopathy. So when we look at concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, it's not always hypertensive um, heart disease. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in about 10% of cases can be concentric. Uh, amyloidosis can be concentric. MRI can help in that, uh, in that uh, 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 aspect when we do the late gadolinium enhancement, where it has a very uh, specific contrast um, uh, pathology, where it is usually global and sub into uh, into uh, uh, endocardial as well as uh, a very specific kinetics of contracts uh, behavior. Fabry's disease all, also have um, predisposition to be involving the infralateral wall. Uh, CMR can further help in differentiate these patients with thick left ventricular hyperatrophy using the T1 mapping and the extracellular uh, volume. So if you summarize case two, we can see that ECHO uh, confirmed the presence of LVH and diastolic dysfunction with increased filling pressure. Uh, CTA has excluded ischemic heart disease. CMR confirmed the evidence of concentric left ventricular hyperatrophy using the CINE images, as well as the pattern of late gadolinium enhancement. And putting all of these pictures together, we can uh, conclude that the case uh, of, uh, of this uh, 56 years old is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction secondary to hypertensive heart disease. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Asafa, for the very uh, nice images and nice cases, really. And very happy heart here. <laughs> it's the smiley <laughs> heart. So uh, we'll move on for the sake of time. We'll move on to Dr. Faraz's presentation. 
So maybe you can share your screen now. And I remind the audience, you can send your questions. We will get the questions and we will answer them at the end. Yes, we can see your presentation. Can you guys see me and hear, see my slides and hear me? Yes, go ahead. I apologize for uh, this uh, for this technical. Uh, I cannot still understand what happened, but um, what I was in, what I intended to do is to uh, uh, discuss, uh, give an overview about a role of multimodality imaging, um, and setting the stage for my colleagues who will be presenting cases in specific disease uh, uh, processes uh, that can cause a heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. Dr. Joeri gave a very compelling talk on the role of uh, echo uh, model based modalities in confirming the diagnosis. We're going to take it next to uh, understand the etiology of heart, uh, heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. These are my uh, uh, disclosures. Um, I will briefly discuss the um, um, uh, epidemiology of heart failure and uh, of HFPEF and discuss why is it so important to make a proper etiological diagnosis in HFPEF in particular um, and discuss the role of various imaging modalities in diagnosis and management and provide some summary and take home messages. Um, HFPEF accounts for 50% of all incident heart failure cases. It is not a rarity, it is very common and as a matter of fact it is the most common cause of heart failure in individuals uh, uh, older than 65 years of age. It is increasing in prevalence uh, uh, a lot more than uh, heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. This is particularly true in women and in the multimorbid uh, uh, patients, um, um, especially as we start seeing a growing uh, prevalence in uh, um, uh, obesity, uh, diabetes, both of which are very important uh, um, uh, risk factors for uh, HFPEF. It is not a benign condition. Uh, it has as bad of a prognosis uh, um, as heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, um, uh, with some uh, studies showing it has slightly better prognosis, but it is not a, a benign uh, condition overall. So, what do we encounter clinically? These are three patients that I have uh, um, uh, taken care of in, in my practice. Um, case one is a 63 year old female who came to the clinic with uh, dyspnea with exertion, uh, progressive weight gain and has lower extremity edema. Uh, her uh, comorbidities include diabetes, chronic kidney disease. She had severe mitral regurgitation um, 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 and, and she failed uh, um, um, a transcatheter uh, edge to edge repair. Um, my initial workup included the BNP, which was elevated. She has elevated filling pressure and she has a normal ejection fraction. So I give her a diagnosis of HFPEF. Second patient is a 42 year old female who came in with more non specific symptoms, but also has fatigue and dyspnea with exertion. And she was previously healthy. She has a markedly elevated NT-PRO BNP and she has an, uh, um, 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 a normal uh, uh, ejection fraction, quote unquote, and also deserved a diagnosis of HFPEF. Uh, she also had grade three diastolic dysfunction. The last patient is an 87 year old male who came with progressive lower extremity edema and dyspnea. He's uh, morbidly obese and has remote history of coronary artery disease and hypertension. His BNP was, uh, was elevated, but his, uh, no, his uh, echocardiogram was also indicating normal LVEF. So all of them received a diagnosis of HFPEF, but the final diagnosis in each one of them was very different and the management was distinctly different uh, 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 in them. So the first patient was diagnosed with valvular heart disease and possibly diabetic uh, cardiomyopathy. The second patient was diagnosed with uh, AL cardiac amyloidosis and was referred for uh, cytotoxic therapy. The third patient was diagnosed with uh, obesity uh, and, and continued to be treated with uh, uh, diuretics. So as you can see, the different uh, um, initial presentation uh, um, and in similar initial diagnosis led to very different uh, management and very uh, um, different final diagnoses. So if you think about this concept in heart failure in particular, you have different disease processes causing um, a uh, the syndrome of HFPEF 
the clinical findings are similar, which may, um, before knowing the final diagnosis, we may treat all of these patients similarly, but th this is probably one of the reasons why effective therapies have not been identified for HEFPEF thus far. And what we propose, what we aim to, to uh, propose in, in, in this session is that using multimodality imaging uh, um, sheds additional light and helps identify underlying disease processes that caused heart failure in the first uh, uh, um, place and subsequently inform the selection of therapeutic uh, uh, interventions and, and referrals. So, so put, put, put differently, there are very germane management implications for uh, the, the premise of this uh, session. First of all, we are all physicians and, and diagnose, making a proper diagnosis is still at the uh, center of, of, of our profession. So we have to make a, the proper diagnosis and understand what's going on with the patient. Second, we guide, we guide referral and selection of therapies. And also we provide uh, um, 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 uh, meaningful uh, risk stratification and uh, prognosis. Patients with amyloidosis, for example, and patients with obesity have very different uh, uh, prognoses and you don't wanna delay therapy for AL amyloidosis, for example, uh, um, um, and unless you use and make the proper diagnosis, you will not be able to uh, uh, um, make, the pro uh, the, uh, make the right referral and initiate the proper th therapies. This slide was shown a different variation of it, is that what are the comorbidities or the causes of uh, a heart failure and um, you know when, when you encounter a patient with HEFPEF there you, you have a list of potential uh, um, uh, etiologies that all lead to a heart failure through complex uh, uh, through complex uh, um, uh, pathophysiological mechanisms uh, that lead to uh, cardiac dysfunction and elevated filling pressures. If you focus on this uh, um, a busy uh, diagram, uh, algorithm that's taken from the European um, 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 Heart Failure Association in a consensus statement. Just focus on the initial uh, part of it. You need to make the diagnosis of HEFPEF relying on, you know, ECG, clinical evaluation, chest X-ray, then confirm the diagnosis with echocardiography, and then they clearly recommend investigate suspected phenotypes by multimodality imaging to help you going down the, uh, this uh, diagnostic and therapeutic um, uh, 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 cascade. And if you look at the different etiologies and the role of different imaging modalities, first of all, you notice that the pr predominant role uh, is for echocardiography and cardiac MRI. Uh, these are uh, very vers uh, uh, versatile imaging modalities that provide meaningful information on cardiac form and function. MRI particularly uh, is um, excellent in providing tissue characterization and providing uh, uh, a quantifying scar burden and um, in, in many uh, cases quantifying uh, uh, valvular uh, lesions. Then, depending on what is the suspected syndrome for coronary artery disease, for example, uh, CT angiography and uh, perfusion, as we will see show, uh, in a few slides, are also critical uh, uh, imaging modalities for cardiac sarcoidosis, cardiac MRI, and PET, uh, especially with FDG. When you're considering cardiac amyloidosis, Dr. Joey Ray showed an excellent case of cardiac amyloid. Um, there is also a role for uh, um, um, cardiac scintigraphy with bone avid uh, tracers. And if you're worried about pericardial disease, you, you will probably end up using a combination of cross-sectional imaging, CTMR, and uh, invasive hemodynamics. So, what, what, what I wanted to do before uh, uh, delving into the specific cases is how do we uh, um, uh, take a step-by-step -step approach uh, to um, once we make a diagnosis of HEFPEF, what is kind of the mental process that uh, goes through at least uh, um, um, my mind and maybe um, um, will we'll ask uh, my colleagues and the panel at the end. So first of all, 
um, uh, common things are common and coronary artery disease is uh, uh, the most common cause uh, of uh, uh, cardiac dysfunction, whether systolic or diastolic. So first of all, you have to exclude coronary artery disease and myocardial ischemia, particularly in patients who have uh, 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 existing coronary artery disease. And if you think about modalities, uh, there is no shortage of modalities that can evaluate for underlying coronary disease and uh, um, uh, ischemia. Uh, um, you know, in the current era, uh, um, cardiac CT, CT angiography plays a very pre uh, prominent role, particularly in patients who are at uh, low to intermediate risk whereas myocardial perfusion imaging plays very critical role in patients who, have, who are intermediate to high uh, pretest likelihood and those with existing coronary artery disease. You can also perform, uh, you can also consider taking them to uh, a stress and invasive coronary angiography right away. And there's also a role for a stress uh, uh, MRI. If we were to just spend a few uh, seconds on uh, specifics of uh, radionuclear and myocardial perfusion imaging, it provides very valuable diagnostic and prognostic uh, information, uh, and it can be accomplished either by PET uh, uh, or SPECT, and this, pro this is going to be the focus of uh, uh, future uh, webinars, inshallah, and you see you can, you can accomplish a lot by referring a patient to either PET or SPECT, including assessment for uh, ischemia, which reflects the status of epicardial vessels. Vessels, detects proper areas of, uh, I'm sorry, remote areas of infarction, provides you assessment of LV function both at rest and post uh, stress. And in the current era of hybrid imaging, you also get an opportunity to evaluate for coronary calcification as a marker of uh, subclinical atherosclerosis. If you refer a patient to PET in particular, then also you have an opportunity to assess the status of, my, uh, of myocardial blood flow, the status of the coronary microcirculation. And in essence, you, you evaluate the coronary tree from the epicardial vessel all the way down to the micro, uh, to the capillary level. And this provides a very comprehensive uh, uh, assessment tool for uh, coronary artery disease. There is also prognostic information that can be gleaned from uh, PET and SPECT. Uh, um, um, the, the, there is wealth of data on the role of uh, radionuclide imaging in predicting the risk of, the risk, uh, risk of death and MI. Uh, there is also uh, um, a robust evidence, albeit uh, observational and retrospective, on uh, identifying patients who are likely to benefit from early revascularization using the extent and severity of myocardial ischemia. And there's also emerging evidence on which patients derive benefit uh, um, um, after revascularization, particularly with PET-FDG. Lastly, uh, whether, whether there is role in, in initiating preventive therapies, this remains to be determined. The second step, so the first step is identify uh, patients and, and, and refer them appropriately uh, based on the presence or absence of coronary artery disease. The second step is to diagnose and treat valvular heart disease as necessary. And here, the uh, main modality and the um, uh, cornerstone is echocardiography, both transthoracic and transesophageal. Um, especially in the current era with uh, structural interventions, there is a critical role for uh, uh, TEE in planning for these uh, uh, invasive, um, uh, for, for uh, structural heart interventions. Cardiac MRI also plays a critical role, um, uh, especially in patient, lesion quantification in patients with uh, um, um, combination uh, or multiple uh, significant valvular uh, abnormalities. Uh, it plays a critical role when there are discordant uh, uh, imaging findings and also uh, provides additional concomitant evaluation uh, for ischemia, scar, etc. So you send the patient to one test and you end up gleaning information on multiple uh, uh, um, uh, parameters for cardiac form and function. I propose that the third step, once you exclude valvular and uh, coronary artery disease, is to identify those with HEF, PEF, and a thick 
left ventricle, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Asafa uh, alluded to, uh, because this is there is a specific differential diagnosis when you see HFPF and increased wall thickness. Whether you call it uh, left ventricular hypertrophy or increased thickness, that's that's also uh, uh, semantics, and and uh, there are some subtle differences. But if you see a patient with HFPF and the thick ventricle, there are a, there is a, a subset of uh, of differential diagnoses that you need to think about, uh, uh, including hypertensive heart disease, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, cardiac amyloid and glycogen storage diseases, among others. The importance is these diagnoses have critical therapeutic and prognostic implications. You do not want to uh, uh, miss a cardiac amyloidosis diagnosis, especially of the AL variety in the current era where there are effective therapeutics. Also, there are very effective therapeutics uh, uh, currently uh, for hypertrophic cardio cardiomyopathy. So identifying a thick ventricle allows you to identify a subset of actionable uh, HFPF patients who can benefit from additional referrals and additional therapeutics. This is a, um, a kind of an algorithm that uh, shows you a role of imaging in patients with uh, uh, heart failure and LV hypertrophy right here in the center. So um, once you identify those patients, what do you do with them? It all depends on the uh, clinical scenario and the most likely diagnosis uh, um, or the top uh, differential diagnosis on your list. Uh, but if you start with cardiac MRI and you find diffuse LGE uh, post-contrast enhancement, that is uh, uh, highly suspicious and highly suggestive of cardiac amyloid. If you find diffuse interceptal LGE with bright spots at the site of uh, uh, RV insertion, that might be indicative of HCM. And uh, Dr. Hussam is going to show us uh, uh, um, um, this is, uh, illustrative cases uh, later on during this, uh, this session. If you find a, a, a posterior lateral intramural, this is very suggestive and pathognomonic for Fabrase. And otherwise, you may find a, a, a finding suggestive of hypertension or aortic stenosis. Um, a, a couple of words on the non biopsy diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, um, the diagnosis, especially of the ATTR uh, variety, can be accomplished using. Um, 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 cardiac scintigraphy with bone avid tracers, uh, 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 pyrophosphate uh, um, is the one uh, currently available in the United uh, Arab Emirates. And it, you know, you can achieve a diagnosis of ATTR amyloid with uh, a sensitivity north of 90% and a specificity close to 90% as well. And there is no need for uh, a, bi a cardiac biopsy in the proper uh, uh, scenarios. Cardiac MRI, as Dr. Asafa uh, already discussed, uh, provides multiple uh, uh, parameters that can uh, help establish the diagnosis of cardiac am amyloidosis, including uh, uh, tissue characteristics, um, uh, and a quantification of uh, um, uh, um, extracellular volume, extent of uh, uh, location and extent of gadolinium enhancement. And I think the most important and promising role for cardiac MRI is in particular monitoring patients once the uh, um, um, therapeutic uh, intervention is started. This is a very uh, um, a promising role that MRI is, is uniquely positioned to be able to uh, deliver. And if you exclude these, these diagnoses that we mentioned in the thick ventricle, this leaves you with a very short list of uh, miscellaneous or other causes of HFPF. Constrictive pericarditis, the right heart predominant HFPF, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Joeri mentioned, the AFib uh, predominant HFPF, high output failure, sarcoidosis, and, and others. So this was supposed to set the stage for the cases. Um, meant to just let you know that uh, HFPF is a common and complex syndrome that is of growing uh, um, uh, magnitude, uh, uh, importance, and cost. Whereas clinical presentation is similar uh, in HFPF, cardiac modalities can help you differentiate uh, certain uh, uh, actionable HFPF phenotypes, as we discussed. Um, this has the potential to impact patient management and outcomes. And um, the, particularly the thick left ventricle and HFPF is a, an important phenotype that should prompt further uh, uh, referral and evaluation with a multimodality imaging. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dr. Faras. That was very nice and comprehensive. Uh, so we'll leave the questions till the end and we'll move to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Amrish uh, Agarwal. Uh, so uh, he's the consultant cardiologist in Fujairah Hospital and has been with the imaging group since its beginning. And he's going to give us a case about aortic stenosis. Yes, sir. Uh, start my video, but I have to share the screen. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Good evening, Dr. Joera. With the excellent talk from Dr. Faraz and with the excellent case of Dr. Safa, she really touched and went to the American and the European Society Consensus paper of 2016, the approach to the patients of dietary dysfunction in the princess of good systolic function. So we come to the subset of aortic stenosis, which is one of the most common abnormality which a clinician can see in the clinical practice. And we all know that the princess of heart failure in the aortic stenosis is the ominous science, but typically when we talk about heart failure, we talk about systolic dysfunction. So let us start a case for a patient who has come to us with a shortness of breath, and he is 66 years old. And as you can see, there is a concentric left ventricle hypertrophy of the, of the, of the left ventricle. The left atrium is dilated. There is little more than mild mitral rotation, which is pointed anteriorly. There is some amount of mitral annular calcification, and the aortic wall is thickened, and not only is thickened in the short axis of the that is kind of calcificate, and the pattern is suggestive of severe aortic stenosis. So a hemodynamic assessment of this wall showed that uh, uh, the gradient, the peak gradient across the aortic wall is 85 millimeters of mercury. The mean gradient is uh, 47 millimeters of mercury, and the calculated aortic wall orifice area is 0 0.6 centimeters square. The left atrium is dilated, the left atrium volume is increased, so it is 46 millimeters uh, in the in the short in the long axis of the left atrium. So when we look at the diastolic function, so we have to see, and as, de as defined by Dr. Safa before, we have to see the e absolute e velocity ratio. So the uh, before that, I will just show that we also did the global longitudinal strain for the patient and the GLS of the patient. You can see with the own eyes, it is typically quite nice, brisk red in color in all the three views, and the long X and the, and the global long strain in the bullseye was nine, minus 19%, indicating a good LB systolic function. So till now, whatever data we saw, we saw a patient with severe aortic stenosis with a thickened left ventricle, but with a good LB systolic long uh, function. So the patient has got a good systolic function as imagined by the 2D echocardiography, as well as imagined by the global long strain for him. But when we look at the diastolic function, we can see very, very clearly that E wave velocity is less than 0.5 meters per second, which is the cutoff. The E to A ratio is reduced. It is only 0.66. So obviously this pattern is not that of a type 2 or type 3 diastolic dysfunction. The both, the lateral and the medial E prime velocities were reduced. The 0.5 was the septal one and the 0.07 was the, was, the, was the lateral one. But the average EA velocity did not use the cutoff value of 15. They were on the moderate size, low of 9%, of 9. So when you have a patient with this type of patients, the current guidelines, whatever the, your current guidelines of the aortic wall, when we talk about aortic replacement, either by a surgical or by the, by the trans catheter, they actually look at a couple of things. They look at the hemodynamic severity of the aortic wall, and the three main class one indication are hemodynamic severe aortic stenosis and symptoms. So symptoms is important component, or LV systolic dysfunction, which is defined by the EF of less than 50%. So these guidelines are mainly focused on the hemodynamic data derived from echocardiography. But like we know in life, we have to actually look at the total picture. So the whole is greater than the sum of its part. So this is the main issue which we change in aortic wall because the damage from the aortic wall goes retrograde back in the left ventricle, in the mitral wall, in the left atrium, in the pulmonary arteries, and to the tricuspid regurgitation. It is fairly assumed, reasonable to assume, and we would be not wrong in assuming that all patients with severe aortic stenosis will have some form of diastolic dysfunction. As so many places where I work, they don't even bother to assess the diastolic dysfunction because they don't think that this patient will have some form of diastolic dysfunction. The reasons are multiple. There is obviously a thickening of the myocardium cells. So there is a left ventral hypertrophy and few patients will have no left ventral hypertrophy. This can also account by the interstitial fibrosis. 
Then, like we said, Dr. Badran, he said very, very clearly, the first thing to exclude in the heart failure, the preserved EF is coronary disease. 50% of patients can have associated coronary disease because the stenosis is the disease of elderly. And there's an increased recognition that amyloidosis can be accounting for a good number of patients, up to 12 to 29% patients of aortic stenosis, particularly in the subset which have a low gradient, low flow aortic stenosis. And there are a number of papers in the literature, and we will not go into it. So how do we evaluate diastolic dysfunction in the patient with aortic stenosis? Unfortunately, the guidelines do not talk about the subset. So they say you follow the general recommendations of the subset of the patient with a good LV systolic function. That means you have to focus on the absolute E velocity should be less than 50. The E to A prime ratio, LA volume should be more than 34 ml per meter square and the RV systolic pressure which should be more than 2.8 meters per second. Unfortunately, in the elderly, such an evaluation is frequently hampered by mitral annual classification and this data can be hazardous to interpret in the presence of mitral annual classification. Particularly, the RV systolic pressure elevated, which can actually account for pulmonary hypertension and is back with the back pressure transmission back from the left ventricle to the left atrium is a well-documented ominous science of aortostenesis. So data is very, very consistent. So in one paper, which looked in 2010, across nearly 225 patients of aortic stenosis, they found that E to A prime velocity of more than 50 is independent and more predictive than ejection fraction in the patient with aortic stenosis. So typically, if you take the subset of the EF more than 50% and these 84 patients, nearly the mortality becomes nearly 1.7 times. So you can see once you have an E to A prime ratio of more than 15, the cumulative survival over this time, over two over about 12 months time, is much more higher than in those patients with the E to A prime ratio of less than 50. Another data which looked at nearly good amount of patients undergoing tower, they found very, very clearly it is the baseline diastolic dysfunction, which is before tower, is more important than the diastolic dysfunction, which is noted after tower, or the change in the diastolic dysfunction, which is noted between the pre and the post. So it is the baseline dy diastolic dysfunction was more predicted for the post tower mortality. So it appears that not only systolic dysfunction, but the structural damage, which is indicated by the baseline diastolic dysfunction has got an important prognostic feature. Another paper which looked in the tower population, they looked at the impact of the baseline diastolic dysfunction and they said that the symptom severity is not correlating very well with diastolic dysfunction. There are some people with a good mild symptoms, they have a more higher form of diastolic dysfunction than those patients with severe. But one thing was sure that more higher the greater dysfunction, the worse is the uh, post uh, tower mortality in the patient. As you can see, over a span of one year, the people with a great rate diastolic dysfunction on the baseline data did worse than the, those people with grade 1 and 2, which is very, very logical because more high value filling pressure, obviously such a patient will not have a good prognostic sign after tower in this one. So it is not exactly the survival, but the symptoms actually correlate with the baseline diastolic dysfunction. So it is just not survival is not everything. It's the quality of life. If you look at the KQC score before and tower in 304 patients, the relationship to the diastolic dysfunction, it appears <clears throat> The diastolic dysfunction grade correlated inversely with the subjective well-being before but not after tower. So it appears that diastolic dysfunction in the IOT stenosis is often under, underestimated and we don't really look in our clinical practice but is an important prognostic sign in the patient of IOT stenosis to look to indicate the prognosis after surgical or, 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 or tower replacement in the general population. That is why in 2018, a paper came out in the European Heart Journal of the Cardiovascular Imaging, which looked that in patients with aortic stenosis, we actually have to look at the cardiac damage staging classification. In obviously the stage jury zero means no staging damage. And then as we go from left to the right, we find from stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four, there's a progressive damage. The stage one means the damage is particularly just related, uh, related to the LV damage. So this means there's LV hypertrophy. There's a more than equal to grade two diastolic dysfunction. There's a reduction of the GLS state and the EF is between more than 50% but less than 60%. As you go from left to the right, you find there's a mitral damage. In stage three, there's a pulmonary vasculature or tricuspid damage. And once you come to stage four, you can have actually RV damage or subclinical heart failure in the general population. So you will actually go through them and you will understand 
that all the stages, they look at some component of systole dysfunction, and there is an indices of diastole in all the stages. For example, in the stage one, they look at the diastole dysfunction, grade two or more. In the stage two, they are looking at the LA volume more than 34 ml, and obviously stage three and stage four, they look at the PA pressures, which should be substantially. Normally, we are talking about diastole dysfunction, PA pressure more than 2.8 meters per second, but the pH, which requires a replacement by the current guidelines, should be more than 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury. And there is a, there is a, there is a link between the staging system and the prognosis in the patient with a severe aortic stenosis. So in one data, which by look by Tasset in GSE in 2019, and in they found that in this population, nearly half of the patients were in stage two and uh, stage two, and the quarter were only quarter one in stage one, but you can see that the uh, the the couple of my for all cause uh, mortality was proportional to the stages. So the people with the stage two, as indicated by this line, had um, three times more higher outcome than in those people who are in stage one. So the diastole dysfunction and the staging cardiac staging by diastole dysfunction has an impact in the survival of the patient with the aortic stenosis. And there are multiple reasons for this. We saw this before, but as outlined by Dr. Insafa. The cardiac MRI has shown there is a more higher extracellular myocardial volume in patients with aortic stenosis. So in a prospective study, which looked at one to four, four patients in 10 international centers, they found progressive increase in mortality and the cardiovascular mortality was seen across all tuss size by extracellular volume. And as Dr. Safa pointed out, this can be seen by the T1 image. So it appears that we have to look at parameters which is beyond the hemodynamics and the current guidelines which look at the hemodynamic parameters leave many things to be desired and we have to start looking at the ventricle as a whole and look even at the back pressure changes in the left atrium and in the in the in the pulmonary circulation in order to understand which patient of severe aortic stenosis who are asymptomatic may be early enough to have benefit from surgical or a transcatheter uh, volvular interventions with this, I nearly finished my 10 minutes and I'm coming to my end of my talk that it is not an easy relationship between the aortic stenosis and diastole dysfunction. It is a done thing. We believe that most of the patients with aortic stenosis will have some form of diastole dysfunction, but it's very, very important to grade them even before thinking of, a, of a interference for him. Uh, uh, is a diastole dysfunction pre-tower, not post, predict mortality and the outcome. It relates to the well-being of the patient with the osteoporosis and the change in diastole dysfunction post tower is complex and less predictive to the cardiovascular outcome. The diastole dysfunction in the osteoporosis is related to the LV remodeling of both myocytes, which obviously hypertrophic. Such a changes can regress after tower, but the change in the interstitium, such as fibrosis and the water and amyloidosis, are not much um, uh, influenced, and the and the and the relationship is kind of variable in the patient with osteoporosis. So with this, I come to the end of the talk and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Amrish. Um, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, we will uh, move along for, uh, for um, uh, sake of time. And um, our next presentation is uh, by my colleague, uh, Dr. Hussam Ghalib uh, from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, who is a heart failure uh, as a consultant, and he's the director of the heart failure, uh, um, sorry, of the uh, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy program at CCAD. He will present a case of uh, the, highlighting the imaging findings in HCM. Hossam, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faraz and Dr. Joeria for the, uh, the invite to participate in this very important um, series uh, and I would like to thank the previous presenters for uh, setting the stage. Um, uh, I have been tasked with discussing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and I have no financial disclosures relating to this topic. So the outline we'll talk about a case presentation. Uh, we'll look into some of the diagnostics and management options and prognoses of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, delve into the utility of multimodality imaging, which is um, the uh, main tenant of this uh, uh, series, and then summarize. So the case is a 39-year-old male who is referred to my hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic, has a history of hyperlipidemia, and he had been having significant exertional limitations of uh, dyspnea and presyncope. 
um, uh, had not been able to do well, so he's referred um, for a second opinion. No past medical history of hypertension, as was uh, discussed by Dr. Safa. Uh, interestingly, he had a family history of dilated cardiomyopathy on his paternal side with very, very significant uh, penetrance. Um, so this was his ECG. Um, as can be noted, he's in sinus rhythm. He has significant LVH, and uh, notably it is of the, um, the apical or Yamaguchi uh, type with deep two-wave inversions. This is um, echocardiogram. Uh, this is the parasternal uh, long view uh, showing a significant um, mid to apical um, uh, se um, septal hypertrophy, uh, as well as hypertrophied uh, papillary muscles. This is the, uh, the apical four chamber uh, showing significant um, mid to apical uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. And the important thing to note is that uh, there is a concern for an apical aneurysm. Uh, interestingly uh, and importantly, the RV seems to be relatively un, uh, unaffected. Uh, uh, the valves look okay. There is some left atrial enlargement, but not significantly severe. And these are important findings as were discussed by the previous presenters. Um, on interrogation with a continuous uh, wave uh, Doppler, uh, there was noted to be uh, some mitral regurgitation, which starts uh, immediately um, uh, with contraction, uh, and there is um, a cavitary uh, obstruction up to 65 millimeters of mercury. Um, however, there was nothing in the LVOT. Uh, strain was discussed several times, um, and this is the patient's uh, strain, showing that in the segments that there is hypertrophy, which are the septum and the apex, there is a reduction in the strain rate. So a continuation. So he had been initiated on beta blockers with no improvement in his symptoms. Uh, he was then switched to uh, selective calcium channel blockers, um, which resulted in just worsening of his dizziness. Uh, and then he had been referred to me. Um, so we initiated the workup. We obtained, uh, uh, as is all the case with our uh, cardiomyopathy patients, specifically hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we obtained Holter monitoring. And of note here, we notice um, uh, different forms of uh, premature ventricular contractions noted in this uh, patient. So further op uh, further testing um, as per our protocol uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uh, exercise stress echocardiography in patients who do not have uh, any evidence of a high uh, obstruction uh, and in our patients where we are uh, unsure of their risk of sudden cardiac death. Cardiac MRI, as has been mentioned several times today, um, with gadolinium, uh, as well as uh, coronary uh, CTA. This is uh, Cine uh, of his uh, cardiac MRI um, in the four uh, chamber view, uh, noticing uh, the significant uh, septal uh, uh, and uh, lateral wall uh, hypertrophy. Um, there is uh, what we call chordal SAM because of the obliteration of the ventricle. Um, uh, but he, uh, notably, he did not have any uh, LVOT obstruction um, in the uh, three chamber views. And uh, the most important thing to be seen here is the fact that he does have confirmation of his apical aneurysm um, uh, in the SIN imaging um, with no thrombus formation. So as is the case with all our cardiac MRIs, there is um, a um, sequencing and protocol for late gadolinium enhancement. And this is the um, short axis view of the left ventricle going from the base to the apex, uh, showing that he does have uh, speckles of uh, increased um, um, late gadolinium enhancement, uh, particularly around in the apex, uh, but nothing uh, that was uh, significant. So what's the diagnosis? Um, at this point, he carried the diagnosis of apical variant hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy because he has symptoms of obstruction and he has an elevated gradient. Um, there is this subtype of uh, apical hypertrophy who have apical aneurysms, and that's important. And we'll discuss that in a second. There is minimal um, late gallium enhancement, which is important for the sudden cardiac risk, uh, sudden cardiac death risk. It doesn't exceed 15%. So. Next, we came up to what the treatment options are, uh, what is uh, risk of sudden cardiac death is, and whether anticoagulation is indicated. Real quick, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common uh, inherited cardiac condition. 
uh, if you include genetic testing, one in every 250 individuals uh, will have this um, uh, uh, genotype. One in every 500 will have the phenotype. And it really, it really is a problem of uh, the way that the thick myofilaments and the thin myofilaments interact, uh, uh, specifically uh, with the interactions of the myosin binding protein C and the heavy, um, uh, heavy chain. Uh, and in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, there is increased uh, probability of these two filaments being in interaction uh, and sort of staying in a locked stage. So the diagnosis requires uh, on echo CT or MRI, a wall thickness of more than 15 millimeters um, in the absence of other conditions that would cause LVH as has been discussed. So systemic hypertension, uh, inflammatory cardiomyopathies, um, subaortic membranes would, not, would need to be ruled out. Uh, importantly, as was discussed in the previous talk, you need to be able to differentiate between hypertensive heart disease and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve is seldom seen in patients with hypertension-related LVH. Uh, the thickness is never more than 18 millimeters usually. And, and usually the hypertrophy and uh, hypertension is usually concentric, um, uh, uh, but it usually involves the apex and the lateral wall um, when it's more of a hyper hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the, uh, the LGE uh, is usually diffuse and, uh, and very prominent in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, other uh, um, phenol copies of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to consider, importantly because these all have uh, uh, treatments with enzyme replacement, um, Fabry disease, uh, Frederick's um, ataxia, Danon's disease. This is usually seen in younger uh, uh, adults or children. It's an autosomal dominant uh, condition, so it usually runs in families. Um, and the the classical finding on uh, biopsy is of the um, or autopsy is of the myocyte disarray, as you see here. Uh, LVOT obstruction is seen in about seventy percent of these patients. These are old M mode images uh, and some two D images showing the uh, systolic anterior motion of uh, the mitral valve. Um, you can see um, uh, here, this is on invasive uh, uh, LV uh, uh, catheterization. And the important thing to note is that obstruction is associated with worsened uh, morbidity and mortality. So it's not uh, benign. It's not just cause of symptoms. It increases your risk of dying by fourfold. And the treatment usually involves um, negative ionotropy and making sure the patient remains hydrated. Uh, this has been the dogma for the longest time, but this is the first trial looking in beta blockers was just published in 2021 um, in Jack, um, showing that metoprolol results in a reduction in the gradients, uh, an improvement in the symptoms of exertional angina. Um, however, there's no uh, change in the maximal exercise capacity. So we've been using medications for uh, more than 50 years, and this would be the first uh, RCT on that. Which brings us to the first uh, selective cardiac medication ever, uh, Mavacamten, which is a novel cardiac myosin uh, inhibitor. And uh, basically what it does is it uh, increases the chance of unlocking the interaction of the thick and thin filaments and returning them back to a close to the native stage. <clears throat> so this was uh, studied in an initial um, a pilot study called the Maverick HCM for patients with symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and it showed... Uh, it showed a reduction in T-proBNP uh, and uh, troponin I. And then there was a subsequent clinical trial, the Explorer, Explorer HCM, which is a double-branded placebo-controlled trial in patients with obstruction and uh, increased NYHA functional class. Um, importantly, this uh, excluded patients with syncope or um, arrhythmias during exercise. So we're looking particularly at the obstruction subtype. Uh, and the outcomes were exertional capacity and improvement in NYHA functional class. And the endpoint, which is combined endpoint, um, was significantly different between the Mavicampton group and the placebo group um, with, a, with a difference of about 19.4 uh, in the absolute. And more of the patients on the Mavicampton with uh, uh, time resulted in having uh, improved NYHA functional class. So much less of them um, were in class three and more were in class one and two. Uh, interestingly, there was a subsidy of this. Uh, clinical trial that looked specifically at MRI uh, variables in about um, 39 patients, I believe. And in, uh, what they noted is that with Mavacamtan, there was uh, a reduction in the LV mass, 
uh, in the wall thickness, in the left atrial um, volume index, uh, as well, uh, but no change in the LGE or in the um, LVF that was statistically significant. And this is just a schematic showing that at baseline um, on placebo and mavacamptan, they were almost similar. But at 30 weeks, the patients with mavacamptan had less um, LV wall thickness uh, compared to those who were in placebo. So, uh, and, and uh, it was shown that once the patients were taken off the treatment, uh, really their symptoms of heart failure got back to uh, uh, baseline as if they weren't on treatment. So these patients need to stay on this medication uh, to sustain the benefit. And, and as such, it was approved in February, 2022 for using patients with obstructive cardiomyopathy, and we're looking to bring it into the UAE. Uh, there's a lot of non-pharmacological management options for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, we won't delve into this uh, a lot today, but septal myectomy with or without mitral intervention, alcohol septal ablation, and then transplant for those who uh, require it. This is a very important um, uh, paper by the Marins um, showing all the different subtypes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's not just apical and septal. Um, you have uh, uh, subtypes uh, uh, that are uh, more of the um, senile or D-shaped in the septum, which is seen with older patients. Sometimes hypertrophy is just at the apex. Sometimes it's just in parts of the anterior wall. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, subtypes. Uh, importantly, the obstruction can happen without the septum being hypertrophied. And, and the thought behind that is that if you have abnormal papillary muscle attachment, as shown in these MRI images, then uh, the cordae will be pulled during systole and they would themselves cause the, uh, the obstruction. So that's why cardiac MRI uh, is very helpful in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is just to show that septal myectomy needs to be performed in high experience centers where have very low operative mortality rates, less than 1%. This is just data from the United States, but there's also similar data from Europe. Uh, this is schematic of how alcohol, alcohol septal ablation is performed um, for patients. And uh, the important thing to note with alcohol septal ablation is that there is a high risk of uh, pacemaker placement in these patients. Uh, so that needs to be something that is discussed with the patients. Uh, this is the largest uh, experience uh, from the European centers showing that patients uh, who have alcohol septal ablation in red have a similar survival to those who undergo myectomy in black and as well as those who undergo medical therapy with medications um, and those who don't have non-obstructive disease. So it really, um, it really, these all, all therapies are seen as equivalent in terms of survival. However, they're not all equal uh, from all these meta-analyses shown here of long-term outcomes, showing that really the risk with um, alcohol septal ablation is more of the pacemaker and the, the higher risk with the septal myectomy is, uh, is, the, is the operative mortality. Um, so this needs to be taken into account. The sudden cardiac death risk in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uh, what we uh, focus on. There's a, the American model, there's the European models, and we calculate them for all patients. Uh, and then we involve the patients in the decision-making. But as you can tell, there's a lot of imaging involved here. Um, there is a maximal LV thickness uh, as seen, left atrial diameter as seen um, in the uh, European model, as well as the gradient. Um, uh, the same is seen on the American model. Um, and the important thing is that it's really difficult to predict the risk of sudden cardiac death as per the 2020 hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guidelines. So a decision uh, should be shared with the patient uh, in making this decision. This is just a schematic of significant late gallium enhancement indicating fibrosis um, as seen here in the short axis view. Uh, and then there's focal regions um, uh, as shown here. And this is data shown from Cleveland Clinic uh, in the United States, showing that if you have more than 15% of your LV volume uh, being replaced by fibro uh, fibrotic tissue, uh, then you have um, uh, much worse uh, survival um, as shown uh, here. And because of that, that's now become a modifier of positional risk of a sudden cardiac death. So if you see that on MRI, more than 15%, we're more likely to have a discussion with the patient about consideration of S um, ICD placement. Apical aneurysms, which we have in this patient uh, and are shown here uh, in this MRI schemes, have a much higher risk of mortality, heart failure, um, clots. Um, and for that reason, these patients are also highly encouraged to undergo ICD placement. Other uh, etiologies, so an MRI, when you see the reverse uh, curvature of the septum, 
Uh, this is usually highly associated with uh, sarcomere mutations that are associated with sudden cardiac death. And these are patients that should uh, uh, be considered for ICD placement as are patients who have the sarcomere mutation. So if we do, if we do genetic testing and uh, we found that you don't have the mutation for um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're much, you have much higher survival rates. So the patient was advised to undergo a transvenous ICD placement for primary prevention, which he underwent. He was placed on disapiramide, which is a negative inotrope, and he had complete resolution of his symptoms, albeit with the worsening of his hyperlipidemia, which is a known side effect. We ruled out concomitant atherosclerotic disease, and importantly, we ruled out myocardial bridging, which can be seen in a lot of these patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, we used the coronary CTA. We underwent a family screening, and nobody had uh, any mutations. So in summary, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is common, but is remains a diagnosis of exclusion. So you need to uh, obtain a good history and physical, do a family history as well. Um, there are several subtypes. And they have varying prognosis and different presentations. Uh, it's important that the patient should have LVH on ECG. Uh, if you don't see LVH, then you need to th think about mimics. Um, the echocardiogram is the first and uh, best study to perform, uh, specifically with Valsalva or with amyl nitrate to bring out any obstruction. Uh, contrast agents should be used um, uh, to determine if there's any hypertrophy in the non-septal segments and look for aneurysms. Cardiac MRI is uh, is a diagnosis that we then jump to after uh, diagnostic modality that we jump to afterwards, and it's very very important in identifying the subtype, uh, identifying uh, high risk features for SCD such as apical aneurysms, the degree of late gallium enhancement. It also helps you with your surgical planning if there's an abnormal cordal attachment, abnormal mitral valve pathology, uh, and as such as you can see, and I hope that I've convinced you that. Uh, no hypertrophic cardiomyopathy program can survive without the, the support of a strong cardiovascular multimodality imaging capability. And with that, I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for this uh, strong and powerful and compelling uh, 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 case uh, for the integral role of multimodality imaging in evaluating patients with HTM. Um, we're going to move along and uh, uh, present the last uh, uh, case for this uh, evening. And it is uh, my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Uh, Jamal, uh, also from uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, who is going to share with us a case of HEFPEF, uh, uh, who turned out to have cardiac amyloidosis and uh, discuss the role of uh, multimodality imaging uh, in workup of patients with suspected, am suspected amyloid. Say it. the floor is yours. Yes. Okay, good evening, everybody, uh, panelists and attendees. And uh, thank you, Dr. Faraz, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see the screen here? Yes, you're good. Okay. So this is an interesting case of patient with uh, thromboembolism and concurrent amyloidosis. I don't have any relevant financial disclosures. So the, the objective and outlines of the presentation, first we'll go through the case quickly, then we'll uh, touch a few points about cardiomyopathy and AL amyloid specifically, and then we'll be open to panel discussion. So briefly, this is a 48 year old female with no previous known significant comorbids or atherosclerotic risk factors. She wakes up with the left-sided hemiparesis, taken to the hospital, was diagnosed with a ischemic right MC infarction, received thrombolysis with TPA, uh, not much benefit. She was then transferred for further management and consideration for advanced treatment. So she, she comes to us at CCAD. She gets a mechanical thrombectomy. Now neurology start to evaluate her for the cause of a stroke in, a, in, a, in a, such a young age without any significant atherosclerotic risk factors. Her neurovascular imaging was negative for significant atherosclerosis and the overall presentation of her stroke on imaging was consistent with uh, an embolic stroke. They go ahead and do an hypercoag screen, it was negative. Now, the important findings in her blood workup, her anti-pro BNP was markedly abnormal with a value of 29.56 and her troponin T was also uh, elevated with a normal kidney function. Her EKG, you can see here, 
we can we can make a case that there are some low voltages in in the limb leads and most of the precordial leads but again not 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 much remarkable you don't see the uh, small r wave or cues that we call the pseudo infarct pattern but still the ecg doesn't kind of really give a clue that something is going on and most of the times this can be passed on as somebody with a thick chest wall or an obese patient anyhow so this is her ekg and then we move on to her imaging now notice on the echocardiogram that she has no history of hypertension but she has uh, uh, moderate concentric lvh and a mildly dysfunctional lv the septal thickness was almost uh, 16 mm Uh, notice the the uh, on in the apical four chamber view. I apologize, it's a bubble study, but you can clearly clearly make out that the atrium appear dilated, and uh, you can see the the mitral inflow here. The E A ratio is clearly more than two. And now coming on to the so we noticed hypertrophy, we noticed dilated atria, we noticed abnormal mitral inflow. We, we went ahead with the strain and. you can see the strain is, is is globally reduced but you can see a relative apical sparing pattern it's already reduced at the apex but it's a kind of relatively less reduced at the apex so the global longitudinal strain was minus 8.8 so this this got us all thinking that what's going on here because if you look at her hypertrophy and her findings of diastolic dysfunction they are out of proportion to her ekgs we should have had prominent voltages and something hinting at lvh but nothing like that on the ekg so this this led us to a diagnosis of some sort of infiltrative or restrictive cardiomyopathy her ef was uh, mildly reduced 45 46% by plane so we went ahead and did a cardiac mri because this also raised suspicion of maybe she has some some coronary artery disease or so the cardiac mri was remarkable as she had some perfusion abnormalities but they were in like a non coronary distribution and more in line with a small microvascular dysfunction she had global hypokinesis and reduced biventricular function her rv ef was 30 35% her lv ef was 38% and she had diffuse late gadolinium enhancement in 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 all of her myocardium lv rv and you can notice here in the four chamber views that we look at the uptake in the in the in the atrial wall in the lv and in the septum so on her t1 mapping she had she had very high values as beautifully pointed out in the earlier presentation so t1 values were, were in excess of 1100 milliseconds which is kind of hinting towards uh, something amyloid related or possibly amyloid going on but she did not have any splenic or hepatic uptake and any lymphat uh, lymphadenopathy we'll come to it later so after the mri it was kind of uh, the the diagnosis was already there that this is some sort of amyloid so a pyp scan was ordered and it came back negative so some sort of uh, uh, heart failure with preserved or mid range ef uh, diastolic dysfunction grade 3 restrictive cardiomyopathy but negative nuclear scan so we 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 stopped here and we paused does this rule out amyloid and negative pyp pyp scan in this case certainly not so we went ahead we ordered the serum and urine immunofixation test which were very remarkable she had igg spikes a very abnormal uh, kl ratio and uh, free uh, lambda chains uh, urine immunofixation was also positive for for light chains so the the overall picture was going more towards uh, non attr or we can say al amyloidosis so hematologist was on boarded for the case bone marrow biopsy and abdominal fat pad biopsies were performed fat pad biopsy was negative for for amyloid negative congo red skin bone marrow biopsy was also negative for amyloid but she have up to 10% of plasma cells so this was also hinting towards uh, abnormal hematological uh, process or some plasma cell dyscrasia going on now the findings on echo the findings on mri everything was hinting towards amyloid but PYP scan, bone marrow, fat pad biopsy—they were all negative. So, based on the clinical suspicion and MRI findings, we discussed with the patient and went ahead with an endomyocardial biopsy. And lo and behold, this came back positive for for amyloid. So, a diagnosis for AL amyloid was reached after a lot of perseverance and digging and patience on the on the patient's part. Now, just to summarize this case: 48 female, AL amyloid. cardiomyopathy 
and an embolic stroke. The, the, the main emphasis point, negative PYP scan, negative bone marrow biopsy, but cardiac MRI and, and uh, endomyocardial biopsy was positive for amyloid. So anticoagulation was initiated because of a prothrombotic state. Hematology oncology on boarded. She was started on chemotherapy. She remains on chemotherapy and, and clinical follow up. So, a couple of points about AL amyloid and cardiomyopathy. It's AL amyloidosis itself is extremely rare. Based on the lit available literature from US, uh, 9 to 14 per million person years cases are reported. It is predominantly a hematologic process, so there is increased risk of cardiac thromboembolism, strokes, PEs, increased risk of it. Up to 60% now, in, in contrast to ATTR, up to 60% of AL amyloid have cardiac involvement. Now, this is also a, a presenting factor as well as a, a prognostic factor. So when cardiac involvement is, is discovered in AL amyloid, it's fairly advanced disease. And based on the available literature, most of the patients, they don't make it beyond the first year after diagnosis. Now, unlike ATTR, AL amyloid has both forms of cardiac presentation. It can present as HEF-PEF. It can also present as HEF-REF with advanced systolic dysfunction, heart failure, and conduction blocks. Bone scintigraphy, PYP scans are negative in up to half of these patients. Anti-proBNP and troponin T act as cardiac biomarkers, and they are a good screening tool. So anti-proBNP and uh, troponin T measurements, they, they, are rise, they, they rise early in the disease. So they should raise suspicion of uh, AL-related amyloidosis because as we know that uh, when cardiac involvement is, is discovered in AL amyloid on imaging, it is already far advanced in the disease. Now being a hematologic problem, uh, the, the hemonc should be involved and targeted chemotherapy like we started in this patient should also always be considered. But then again, there are, there are challenges in this regard uh, pertaining to the poor prognosis with, with this uh, variant of amyloid. Plus, uh, after diagnosis of AL amyloid, majority of the patients, they usually get diagnosed with another plasma cell disorder, usually Waldenstorm's macroglobulinemia or multiple myeloma in the preceding six months to one year. Plus, when you start them on targeted chemotherapy, we all know chemotherapy affects the cardiac function in a worse way, which again, puts them at higher risk of further cardiac complications and, and worsening of disease. So the, the important and take home message from this, this talk would be negative PYP scan doesn't mean no amyloid. And uh, again, there is, uh, there is no alternate for clinical suspicion and diagnosing this variant of amyloid requires a lot, a lot of perseverance and, and digging on the clinician's part. Uh, with this, uh, we are open for panel discussion and, and questions. Thank you, Dr. Said. It was a really good case. Actually, I have the exact sister of this case uh, that we follow her, but she actually exactly the same scenario, almost different kind of thromboembolism, but she refused to go for myocardial biopsy, uh, which, which highlights the importance of having this test. If you don't do it, then you, you're not going to reach the diagnosis. Uh, so we can have all these speakers uh, on and we can uh, maybe take a few uh, minutes to answer some of the questions. I'm going to answer the first question because it's uh, quite easy. So someone asked how to measure uh, the global work index. So global work index is a software on um, a GE machine. So if you have a GE echo machine, then you can measure it. And you just do the same steps for doing a uh, strain. And then you measure the patient's blood pressure and you enter it on the machine and that's it. So it's, it only takes a, uh, into account the patient's uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And it just gives you the, all the um, uh, measurements. Uh, so it's very simple. So I think one of the questions is actually applies to all the panelists. Uh, because we all talked about uh, heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. So they're asking, uh, do you need to have structural changes uh, to make the diagnosis um, uh, of heart failure with preserved ejection fractions or uh, elevated filling pressures are enough?
I think so anyone. I'll, I'll, I'll take yeah. this. Go I'll ahead. take this question. So, um, so heart failure is a clinical syndrome. So, if you have symptoms of uh, shortness of breath, um, exertional limitation, and you have elevated lift filling pressures, that those those two in of, in of themselves um, fit the clinical diagnosis. So. The uh, the structural changes uh, would be supportive in this nature, and and you can go all the way from strain, um, specific cardiac MRI findings, all the way to LVH, uh, left atrial enlargement, diastolic dysfunction, but um, elevated filling pressures um, with symptoms is heart failure. Yes. So the key is you have to show the elevated filling pressures somehow. Yes. Um, and so, then the structural changes can be uh, there or cannot be there, depending on what this, what's the cause of the heart failure. Or yes. Failure. So if you have if you have high output heart failure, you know, you may not have all the findings. If you have heart failure with recovered ejection fraction, you may have a normal EF and still have symptoms of heart failure. So um, they go hand in hand. Um, but yes. yes. So, I think we also have to distinguish between diastole dysfunction and heart failure. They are not necessarily synonymous. Diastole dysfunction is a phenomena we see on echocardiography, and the patterns for diastole dysfunction, the criteria will differ when the EF, uh, left ventricular function is normal, or if there's atrial fibrillation, if there's annular calcification, or if there's structural myocardial disease. Whereas heart failure is, uh, uh, you can have a heart failure in the absence of diastole dysfunction. You can have diastole dysfunction in the absence of heart failure. So the two things are not exactly synonymous. Yes, they go together most of the time, but not synonymous. Yes. But if I, I may add to that, when we talk about structural heart um, problems, such as enlarged lift atrium or lift ventricular hyperatrophy, um, now with the dramatic improvement in multimodality images, uh, we can identify these structural abnormalities by eyeballing, by different parameters, such as we have been explained by the different speakers, uh, strain, my, um, uh, such as, uh, for example, maybe lift atrial strain. Uh, these are all indicators of structural heart abnormalities or, or abnormal uh, uh, heart structure. Traditionally, it's only thought increase in the in the chambers of either left atrium, left ventricle, or or left uh, LVH. However, with all of the improvement in the uh, in, in, in multimodality imaging, we can um, sort of identify stage A heart failure uh, patients, uh, especially in this category with heart failure or preserved ejection fraction. So, uh, Dr. Faras, you showed nicely how to, you know, reach the diagnosis in terms of heart failure, which tests to go first. So one of the questions um, they were asking in terms of limited resources, can you go ahead and treat the patient based on uh, clinical features or do you need uh, to show uh, an elevated BNP? So uh, what's your take on that? You know, uh, I think I think that's the, the the science is one thing, and the art of medicine is is another thing. How do we function in a, a resource limited environment? Is is a, is an art and a skill, um, and I I, I I don't think uh, limited resources should uh, um, preclude us from uh, uh, <clears throat> doing our job and arriving at the right diagnosis because the right diagnosis means uh, pr proper. Uh, initiation of proper therapies. Um, you know, I, th I think it is it's very critical to to be able to to collaborate and and uh, have a low threshold. Uh, if you have a suspicion of a specific diagnosis, to 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 make the necessary referrals uh, to another uh, institution where the resources that are needed are available. Um, we may be able to treat and mask the symptoms by giving uh, uh, diuretics and so on and so forth. Uh, but reaching the right diagnosis is absolutely uh, uh, fundamental in, in taking proper care of patients. That's correct. Uh, just recently, yesterday, we had a patient who was um, not known to have heart failure. So he had COVID pneumonia in January and came in with exertional shortness of breath, lower lymphedema, pro-BNP normal, 45, and still got admitted as a heart failure. And then he underwent his echo 
and then the ejection fraction is normal, the ethylic function is normal, RV pressure is normal. Uh, everything was, strain was normal. So this, this tells you the, the importance, even if the clinical symptoms, he has shortness of breath, he has crackles, and he has lower lymphedema, there is another explanation for that. And if you don't, that's, that's the importance of using the ProBNP, using your imaging uh, to reach the diagnosis. Of course, this patient in the emergency will get a Lasix and probably will get better, but that does not mean that this patient had heart failure. Uh, so, I mean, yes, you can treat the patient, but then you have to reach to the diagnosis of what's the underlying problem and how to prevent it, because especially for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, now we have therapies. We used to treat them just with Lasix, but now if you have a, a myelidosis, you can treat that. If you have AL, you can treat that. Uh, you can give um, sacubitril vasartan for certain patients, you can give spironolactone for certain patients, and definitely you can give SGLT2 inhibitors for all patients. So uh, since we have therapy, it's very, very important to reach the diagnosis. Um, Roger, so, I mean, if I may ask, I know we are a few minutes over, ta uh, over time, but I want to ask us the panelist experience. It's, it's very, um, it's emphasized uh, the role of uh, stress echocardiography for diagnosis of uh, diastolic dysfunction and HFPEF, not testing for coronary disease. It is so super uh, emphasized in, in many of the consensus statements. However, at least in our uh, clinical experience, we don't, we, don't, we don't use it that often. We don't, uh, we, we don't realize this benefit in our clinical practice. I wanted to know, is that the case also, you know, in other settings, uh, uh, you know, just input from a couple of the panelists on what is their experience uh, with the uh, stress testing for uh, diastolic dysfunction? I can uh, say for our center, we use it very uh, rarely, like you said. Uh, and the reason uh, for that is usually when you get someone with heart failure of preserved ejection fraction, you have lots of comorbidities. So you have someone with COPD, um, uh, you know, usually the image quality is not very good. So you don't end up going for a stress echo because you know, like at baseline, the image quality is not good. You do the stress echo, you're not going to see anything. So it's very limited, um, I think, uh, number of patients that you're going to use uh, stress echo to diagnose diastolic dysfunction. Uh, you need to have good image quality, and you, do not, you, you, don't, you need to not be able to reach the diagnosis before that. And usually you have other parameters on echo, you have the BNP, so you can reach the diagnosis without going to that uh, level. So maybe we can hear from the other centers. What about you, Dr. Asafa and uh, Dr. Agrawal? The same in the case, very rarely uh, we use it, to be honest with you, to the reasons that you just highlighted. Okay, um, I, we, to be respectful of everybody's time, we're a few minutes uh, um, uh, over time. I would like to uh, sincerely thank each and every uh, uh, panel member for, for their contribution and their, their very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joeria, for uh, helping out co-moderate this uh, session, especially with the technical difficulties. Um, I would like to thank the audience as well. And um, uh, join us in the next uh, session that's going to be in September. More details to follow. Um, uh, we look uh, forward to your contribution, your feedback on the timing, the topics. And then this year, next year, we're going to be very busy in terms of educational activities on the um, uh, um, uh, cardiac imaging front. So stay tuned and feel free to join us. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you.